Welcome, everybody, to another episode of People on the Move, a Cargomatic podcast. I'm super excited to have Beth Ann Rooney, uh, Port Director of the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, with us today for a special episode about Women's History Month. Uh, Beth, thanks for joining us. Obviously, you've had such a tremendous journey in this industry. Uh, we're at a time in this industry where we're seeing more female leaders than we've ever seen. Let's kick it over to you. Talk a little bit about your journey, uh, how you uh, ascended to really be the head of the top port authority in the entire nation, uh, and and what it means to see so many women colleagues now uh, running not just major ports, but also major organizations like uh, the BNSF and other large corporations. Well, let me first start, uh, Weston, with a big thank you to you and Cargomatic, uh, not only for inviting me to be a part of this uh, podcast today, but for recognizing uh, Women's History Month and particularly uh, women in transportation. Now, when I think back to uh, when and how I got into the business, uh, I was never thinking about uh, how many women were in the business. Uh, I was, you know, a young high school kid. Uh, learning about the maritime industry and being a merchant marine and the prospect of sailing around the world on ships. And I just fell in love with the concept of, you know, how cool is this? I'm going to sail around the world on a ship. And I had never been on a ship in my life, you know, maybe had been on a sailboat, you know, somewhere in the, you know, 80 foot range as the largest. And then all of a sudden I was, you know, going to be on ships that were, you know, uh, half a football field at the time you know, or, or more longer. So, you know, I, I, I graduated from New York Maritime uh, College uh, in the Bronx, New York in uh, 1991. Uh, my full intention was to uh, develop and be a ship captain. And unfortunately, uh, my eyesight uh, was playing games with me. And I wound up uh, losing uh, the license to be a third mate. Uh, so I wasn't able to sail professionally uh, on ships. So re-shifted, uh, re-thought uh, about what it was that I was going to be. And at that point, I had bills to pay, uh, you know, college tuition to start paying off. And I uh, was able to get a job uh, with a, a steamship agency that was just starting operations uh, here on the East Coast. And I uh, was able to uh, be a part of uh, developing uh, the new business for this long-standing California company uh, and wound up working, you know, on ships, mostly tramp ships, uh, meeting them, you know, up and down, you know, the East and, and Gulf Coasts. And I did that for about three years uh, before uh, joining the Port Authority. And when I joined the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, uh, to be honest, I... Uh, it did everything that they tell you not to do in an interview. I knew nothing about the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. I didn't even know, um, because we are unique among Port Authorities, I didn't even know about the Port Authority bus term terminal in Manhattan. I grew up, you know, upstate, you know, what some people would consider upstate, and didn't know anything about the Port Authority. But uh, thankfully, there was an alum uh, from New York Maritime College who uh, had some faith in me. Uh, because of where I came from, and he took took a bet and hired me, and uh, I'd say the rest is history. So uh, I've had the pleasure of having you know six or seven very distinct jobs in the Port Authority, uh, all in the Port uh, Department, uh, from operations to leasing and property management. I spent some time working in uh, intermodal transportation, at uh, developing now what is our express rail system. Uh, worked on developing the first marine highway uh, system uh, uh, coming out of New York and New Jersey and, and actually bought barges and cranes to support that operation. Uh, from there, moved into technology, uh, but not technology uh, for desktops, but technology for how technology was going to make the business more efficient and more productive. And then 9-11 happened, and uh, the day after 9-11, I had been in Washington that day. My office was in the World Trade Center, uh, but I was in Washington, D.C., uh, the second safest places to be in the country, and um, came back to the port uh, the morning of September 12th, and the then port director gave me a hug and a kiss and said, thank God you're okay, you're in charge of security. 
And I spent the next, you know, 14, 14 and a half years uh, doing port and maritime security. I was uh, very uh, blessed to have the opportunity to shape uh, port and maritime security and emergency management, you know, in the United States. I was part and parcel of uh, writing the regulations that are in place today. I was part of the international process, uh, testified before Congress numerous times. And uh, developed what you know is a uh, recognized worldwide uh, maritime security program, you know, in New York and New Jersey. And then, uh, thanks to some problems uh, that the West Coast was experiencing uh, at the time, and we were getting uh, some more cargo from the West Coast. Uh, we also were coming out of the throes of Hurricane Sandy, uh, where the port was uh, obliterated. Um, uh, we lost about a third of, you know, all of our trucks and chassis and, and equipment. Um, congestion became a problem. And uh, I was asked by the then director, uh, you know, about what we could do to help solve some of the congestion and performance issues. And he, he had an idea and I told him I didn't think that was the right idea. Um, and he asked me what to do. And I said, I don't know, let me think about it over the weekend and I'll get back to you. And on Monday morning, I handed him a white paper for what uh, became the the Council of Court Performance uh, that we launched uh, now back in 2014. And uh, Weston, that Council of Court Performance continues to operate today. Uh, we have all stakeholders uh, in the port uh, from labor terminals, ocean carriers, warehouses, uh, MPOs, trucking, forwarders, brokers, you you name it. Um, we've got them on the council of court performance. And, and what was important was that everybody needed to understand how each aspect of the industry works so that we could then work collaboratively towards a solution so that we could become more resilient to the next disruption whatever that might be. Uh, you know, and then little did we know, you know, 2020 would come around and, you know, we would have a, a global pandemic. Um, so, and I firmly believe that having the Council on Port Performance in place, uh, using that structure, having those relationships, having that understanding uh, is one of the reasons why the Port of New York and New Jersey was able to weather the storm uh, better than, you know, some of the other ports many of the other ports are around the country. So um, so I left security and uh, started this new role that was the assistant director for port performance. Uh, from there, I became the deputy director of the department, the number two position. And then um, 11 months ago, uh, was named uh, the director of the port of New York and New Jersey. So it, it's been an incredible career um, I wouldn't be where I am uh, without an awful lot of uh, support um, behind the scenes, uh, mentors uh, that were many times dragging me, kicking and screaming. Um, uh, the first director that I had uh, was Lillian Barone, the first female director ever uh, in the United States. And uh, honestly, if it wasn't for Lillian dragging me along, um, and dragging me out of my comfort zone, you know, three or four years into into the start of my career in the Port Authority, I wouldn't be, you know, where where I am. But I've been I've been blessed by mentors, and I've been blessed uh, every step of the way, uh, just with incredible colleagues, uh, both internal to the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and externally in the in the Port of New York and New Jersey. Um, I can't compare to other ports, but I know we've got something special going on here. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, from captaining ships to captaining the largest seaport uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, I think you've done all right transitioning from being a, a sea captain to really a port captain, if you will. Uh, before we shift into some of the many things you brought up about the port and uh, where we've come from and where we're going and are we prepared, uh, you know, for those of uh, our listeners who don't know Beth, she's really one of the best minds in the entire industry. She's she's super talented. And, you know, you you mentioned Lillian and her impact on your career. And I'm a firm believer that uh, in life, it's all about people, right? There's there's people that help us get where we ultimately go in our lives. And then we uh, touch many people, some more directly than others. But 
for our listeners out there, what's the biggest piece of advice that you can give them, especially aspiring young women who are looking to become leaders in this industry, whether they're looking to own you know, a trucking company, whether they're looking to rise in the ranks of the many steamship lines or railroads, or if they want to follow in your footsteps and, and be a female leader of one of the nation's largest seaports, what advice would you give them? I've got a host of advice, you know, for, for that. And, uh, you know, I, I'd say there's a couple of things. I mean, one is, is finding, you know, yourself a mentor and, you know, establishing a relationship with somebody, you know, that you can just bounce things off of that, you know, could help open doors that help and not open doors to new jobs and new opportunities, but, but opening doors just to have access to events, to meetings, to discussions, to a cocktail hour, you know, whatever, whatever the case might be. So I think uh, finding yourself a mentor, and it doesn't have to be a woman. Um, again, some of my other uh, greatest mentors uh, were, are all men, you know, in, in the industry. Um, the second thing is, is taking risks and, you know, really being able to step out of your, of your comfort zone. Um, you know, if, like I said, I was dragged kicking and screaming to leave working in port facilities where I was, you know, wearing, you know, uh, dockers and, uh, work boots, you know, and uh, jeans every day to having to go to the original world trade center, which, you know, in the mid nineties was, you know, very formal, you know, and stuffy, uh, <laughs> you know, so, um, I literally cried. I literally cried, you know, going to the World Trade Center those first couple of weeks because it just wasn't my comfort zone. Um, so taking risks, you know, and, and you know, trusting, you know, others, you know, uh, if you don't trust yourself. And and the, the third thing I would say among many other pieces of advice would be, you know, stepping outside of the box. Um, I often, there were often times in my jobs and the various positions that I held that I had a little bit of spare time here and there, or I saw a problem and, and I just volunteered to work on it and to, and to, to step in and, and help out and, and being able to do that exposed me to so many other aspects of the industry that if I stayed in my lane, I would never have had that exposure. So, you know, over the course of my career, you know, I've had direct interplay with, you know, safety, security, fire protection, engineering, sustainability, resiliency, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and I didn't hold jobs in those positions, but I was doing projects in those positions because I kept being willing to step out of the the finely defined um, parameters of my job description, you know, to do what I needed to do to help the team and help advance the cause. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. And, you know, it's not always easy to get outside your comfort zone, but to go up the corporate ladder, whatever that looks like, you, you got to know how the organization works inside and out. You know, that, that is a big piece of it. And having mentors that help push you in the right directions are, uh, turn those those tears into dedication and, and passion, right? Uh, help, help give you that pick-me-up when you need it. That's great advice. So let's shift gears slightly because you are a fellow break nerd, and I know we love discussing all things. And, you know, let's, let's start with, you know, we're coming out of a big pandemic, obviously. It's going to reshape how uh, ports work, how the supply chain and the distribution chain work. Uh, and one of the things you mentioned that I am such a big proponent of is is collaboration, right? We are an ecosystem when it comes down to it. Uh, talk a little bit about the experience of putting together uh, your performance task force at bringing those stakeholders together. Uh, you know, when I ran the Harvard Trucking Association, we did a lot of similar things, not just at the macro level, but then even, you know, at individual terminals uh, with the chassis providers trying to be a conduit to understand how do all the pieces of the puzzle fit together, because we'll get into this a little bit later, but we all need to understand what didn't work, especially over these last two years, if we want to be prepared for what's going to happen down the road. And, and as you know, I, I, I started in this industry in 2014, right in the middle of a massive labor dispute on the West Coast. And I was told we've never seen anything like this. Well, little did I know we'd have at least one once in a lifetime event that would disrupt at least the seaports, if not the entire supply chain 
every year since then. And and talk a little bit about that preparation because you're built. You, what you did was you built the foundation. Right. Right. Well, and, and let me uh, just say, I've been called a lot of things. Freight nerd is not, you know, in my uh, list, but uh, I might need to add that. So. It's a term of endearment. It is. It is. It definitely is. So, you know, when we were experiencing the problems back in 2014, 2015, and, and I sat down with individual stakeholders in the industry to try to understand what was going on and why and to peel apart that onion. And as I talked to from different stakeholder to different stakeholder, it became very clear to me that most stakeholders did not know how the supply chain operated upstream and downstream of them. They knew their role and they didn't know what else happened in the supply chain. So, you know, uh, and, and at the time, shippers, beneficial cargo owners, consignees never visited marine terminals. You know, they had contracted for their goods to be moved from point A to point B, and they didn't know what happened in a terminal. So if their box was lost, uh, if their box was in a closed area, um, all sorts of things. They had no idea what that meant. Uh, so so breaking down the barriers and and breaking down those silos so that first there was an education and that all of the key decision makers not only understood their segment of the industry, but they understood the triggers that if I turn this, you know, valve, what's going to happen upstream and downstream? What are the effects? What's the cause and the effect of decisions that I make that I make with blinders on and don't care? about what happens. And it was about bringing people to understand that when the ecosystem that moves through the port of New York and New Jersey is not operating in precision, everybody loses. You know, so it was a lot of visualization and and showing people how the supply chain works, showing people those relationships and those interdependencies. And one of the things, Weston, as you know all too well, that makes our industry very complicated is the contractual relationships that you have no piece of, but you're such an important part of affecting the delivery on that contract. You know, so the terminal operator who only has a relationship with the ocean carrier, a contractual relationship with the ocean carrier, the work that the terminal operator does to support the trucker, to support in some terminals, the chassis provider, to support the rail providers, right? They are not contractual business partners of terminal operators, but they are vitally important to how those parts of the supply chain move. So um, look, it wasn't easy by any way, shape or form, but it was years of driving conversations to drive the understanding and to get folks to fully believe and understand that when you move one valve and you take the blinders off, that you can create efficiency and productivity. And when you do so, everybody wins. Um, and if you don't, the cargo is going to go someplace else, right? And when the cargo goes somewhere else, the port authority loses, the terminal operator loses, the truckers lose, the labor you lose, the, the warehouses you lose, and everybody else in between. So um, we don't always get it right. Um, it's not always, you know, uh, you know, uh, roses and you know other you know nice things <laughs> but but and that's business but there's at least a desire to collaborate and coordinate and to create transparency and to make improvements for the good of the whole with a recognition that when it works for one it works for everybody yeah, you, you touch on something so important. Uh, and when you think about 
uh, a marine terminal. Their, their customer is the ocean carrier, as you pointed out, but their consumer is everybody else that's coming in and out. It's the cargo owner who is di dictating whether they like the terminal or don't like the terminal. It's the trucker who's telling the cargo owner, uh, I do or don't want to go to that terminal. In some cases, having surcharges for different terminals throughout the country, if they feel like turn times are too long or they can't do dual transactions and they need to do split moves, et cetera, um, and, and so on and so forth. And you talk about the, uh, the relationship, right, between the contracted parties and let's call it the non-contracted supporting parties, right, the, the broader ecosystem. And I'm going to go there, right? OSRA just obviously is something that's a hot topic in the industry. Uh, there are some that are wildly uh, bullish on what it's going to do. Others are worried about the unintended consequences. And then some are somewhat in the middle that feel like maybe the biggest thing, which is uh, some of the participating contracts, namely the, the Uniform Intermodal Interchange Agreement, UIIA, uh, are not necessarily in, in conformance with the new... OSRA, talk a little bit about that, because I know you have concerns about OSRA, the unintended consequences, and maybe some of the things that have been left out that need to be looked at, and some of the things that have been looked at that should have been left out. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, you know, um, look, this is a, a slippery slope, um, but I also think what the slippery slope is, is regulating in the middle of a crisis. Um, and, and what we've experienced for the last you know, now three years, literally uh, yesterday was three years. Um, what we've experienced in the last three years is is not the norm. And the the volumes of cargo, you know, somewhere between 20 and 35 percent that U.S. ports have grown in the last uh, three years, depending on which port you're talking about, that's abnormal. Um, and that is that is volume that was driven by a, a whole host of changes in the socioeconomic, you know, uh, things that were driving consumer spending, and and the fear that there were going to be further lockdowns in China and you know and elsewhere that would stop production. So let me bring in more just in case, and let me bring in it sooner you know, just in case. And all of those decisions that were being made um, created this oversupply of stuff. We we know now that, uh, and have known for a while, that warehouses just have bloated inventory. Um, volume is down so significantly, you know, now, and, you know, just through February, you're looking at ports that have volume, you know, that is, you know, down off of last year, upwards of 43%. I mean, that's massive, massive changes in volume, you know, fluctuation. Lowest month of imports in every, almost every single seaport back all the way to March of 2020, May of 2020, when ports were shut down in many right. years. Right. No, it's, it's crazy, crazy fluctuations. But what's happening right now is a reflection of what was happening for the past two years, I would say, in the oversupply of stuff. So this is a correcting the course. So, so you know, so one, you know, definitely concerns about, you know, regulating in a crisis and the unintended consequences that, that come, for, come from that. Um, the biggest concern that I have as a port authority comes with the demerge and detention rules. And it's not to say that some of the demurrage and detention that was charged was unjust. Unquestionably, it was. Um, but when you look at demurrage and when you look at a container occupying a space in a port authority, a public port authority, public lands, and then not the terminal operator, not being able to charge for occupying that parking space because it is incumbent upon the terminal operator to prove that the other parties who they don't have a contract with had the ability to pick up those containers. So my concern, Weston, is that the unintended consequence 
is because that burden of proof for the terminal operator to justify charging to merge is going to be so steep that we will have containers willfully staying on the terminals longer because the terminals will be able to charge. So we did a study and an analysis, and we looked at keeping the container on the terminal, taking the container off of the terminal and putting it in an off-terminal CY, or taking the container off the terminal um, and transferring the material into, into a warehouse. And all of the, the moves, the chassis, the, the returns, the space that, that goes along with that. And it's 12 or 13 days that you can stay on a terminal before it doesn't, before it makes sense for you economically to move it off of the terminal. So now if the terminal operator has, has a difficulty in proving that there was an ability to pick up that container, then containers stay longer, dwell time increases, congestion increases, you have more ships at anchor, and, and what have we actually done to create fluidity within the supply chain? You know, the, the second part of the demerge and the detention, you know, rules, and again, I don't know how it is in, you know, in other ports, but, you know, historically, at least in New York, New Jersey, when a container is in demerge, it stays in demerge. And when the terminal's not open on Saturday or, or Sunday or for a holiday, uh, the, the parking rent you know, continues to accrue. Um, the ability or the inability to do that in the future is also going to impact the ability of the terminal operators to continue to operate efficiently. So do you, do you wind up opening the containers, the container terminals on Saturdays, but nobody comes. So we opened our container terminals, three of our terminals opened every Saturday for 18 months. And in those 18 months, 4%, 4% of our total cargo volume moved on a Saturday. But years ago, we heard from the community, if you open on Saturdays, we'll be there. And you need to open on Saturdays consistently. And we made, we delivered the message. We will be open and we will open consistently. And nobody comes. Why does nobody come? Because the rest of the supply chain hasn't adjusted because the warehouses and distribution centers aren't open, because there weren't enough chassis, because there isn't enough truck power, or there's not enough truck drivers who have hours of service available to them. So now we have to work on the workforce so that we can have enough workers in order to have the supply chain operating longer hours. We need to change municipal rules perhaps because there's warehouses that the local municipalities don't want the warehouses, you know, to be receiving trucks, you know, over, overnight. So in the Port of New York and New Jersey, we're focusing on the transformation of the industry that is needed. And I, we've got staff now that are focused expressly on port performance and efficiency, and they're working on the far end of the supply chain. They're starting at the warehouse and they're working their way back to the port. The port and the port terminals are doing what they need to do. They're making the investments, they're making improvements, but the inefficiencies and the congestion that is felt at the ports is a factor of things that are occurring outside of the ports and terminals. Many yeah. times, not always, many times. Yeah, you know, it's it, this whole industry is so complex and everybody tries to figure out a silver bullet answer to solve all the problems. And, it, and it's really about trial and error, understanding when you fix something, what's the stress test, what breaks downstream? And to your point, you know, I think from the trucking community and the shipper community perspective, ASRA is there to try to fix inequities that they've dealt with, but to create inequities then on the other side of it, you end up with the same result. And it's about fixing the problem, not changing the reason we have the problem, right? Right. And, and I think that's a, a great segue into uh, what do we need to do as a supply chain or a distribution chain in totality to try to safeguard against another COVID-type uh, result from, from what happened. Because at the end of the day, as I said, so we've had a different issue uh, 
almost every year I've been in this industry, and that's that's more than a decade now. And we have the same results. It's, I think what COVID did for the first time is it wasn't a peak season where for maybe three or four months you see the, uh, these drastic increase in cargo and you kind of have the ability to muddle your way through it until the the in like the the impacts of the in, the cargo coming in resolve itself right just just like the ships waiting to get into the ports of la long beach we were able to cycle through them in a couple months because ships stopped showing up right it wasn't it wasn't that we figured out how to process them faster and and i think that's this that can be the the, the same at almost every seaport that saw a backlog of ships you can make some improvements here or there but you, with your background, obviously, security, uh, systems in general, both infrastructure as well as digital infrastructure, uh, talking about government and the role it plays beyond the terminal, right? How do we make sure that we have the right type of operating hours? How do we make sure that we're putting the right type of uh, warehousing or rail or highway infrastructure there? To, in, what are the three biggest things that we need to do as supply chain professionals to try to safeguard a against these types of massive disruptions. Because to your point, we saw an astronomical increase in the volumes coming through the seaports. Everything from we couldn't get our stuff and then it all kind of showed up at one time to, hey, keep buying stuff because we don't know when this is going to happen again. It was a little bit of a, a chicken little situation. The sky was right. falling and we needed to make sure that it didn't fall again. But moving forward, what can we do to safeguard? Because this, is, this isn't going to be fixed overnight, but we really need to prepare because the volumes we've seen over the last two years are commensurate with the volumes that most seaports say that they want to have consistently by the end of this decade. The answer to your, your question, uh, Weston, you know, what we have is a supply chain that is missized, you know, or outsized, and we have ships that are operating 24-7, 365, they're getting larger, there's more of them. We have the key side or the berth side of the container terminals that are operating 24-7, 365. Our terminals have made, uh, across the board, our terminal operators have made significant investment in what happens uh, inside the terminal. And then the pipeline, right, begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So what happens is the capacity of our supply chain, the capacity of our ecosystem gets to be not that six foot in diameter pipeline that's outside your home. It gets to be the capacity that's the trickle that's coming out of your, you know, kitchen faucet. And, and until we can right size the supply chain and at least get the other segments in the pipe to be closer in capacity to what the terminals are able to do, then we are going to continue to have the problems uh, that we've experienced. And that's precisely why the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and our partners are working from the faucet back to that second link in the supply chain. Because over the last decade or longer, the port authorities and our terminal operators have invested in the common user infrastructure and they've invested in, in the what's needed inside the terminals. Cargo handling equipment, new operating systems, additional capacity, densification, additional yard space. But there hasn't been the same level of investment in equipment, people, processes, changes in procedures everywhere else. So we've got to make the rest of the supply chain in that ecosystem closer in size and capacity to the ships and the terminals. Yeah, that's and that's a tremendous graphic because we always talk about it as a funnel, right? And and I think this this probably even better because you have the different linkage of the pipes, but as the ships keep getting bigger, as the cranes keep getting taller, uh, the only way that you can actually make the terminals move more cargo is to be more efficient in getting things out of the terminal, right? Because let's be honest, all of our major seaports are in hence heavily densely populated areas that don't have a lot of developable land. Uh, you have uh, 
you know, in many cases, a lot of other political wills that combat with the the needs of the supply chain industry. But at the end of the day, if we can make everything more efficient, if we can talk about operations and not just, you know, zero emissions equipment or, uh, you know, those types of things, which I'm not saying aren't important, but if we could move more with less, we could move more faster. All of the things you're talking about become so much easier. And that's going to be a combination of physical infrastructure, raising bridges, uh, building warehouses, expanding freeways, as well as digital infrastructure, being smarter at what we do, knowing who's coming for what, when. So to your point, don't have a Saturday gate if you're only going to move 4% of your cargo on Saturday. It's a very expensive operation. However, if you know that you're going to have, you know, 25% of the cargo move via peel off on a Saturday for a few select shippers and truckers, you want to know that. Why, why not get that set up, right? Um, using the appointment systems as a conduit to move more cargo, not as an obstacle to not be able to pick up your cargo. And th these are all just discussions that need to happen. And what we need to do is not tighten the top of the funnel, but but widen the bottom of that funnel and and stop restricting the flow of goods. Because at the end of the day, we have parts of the supply chain that just get congested. And what happens when they congest? It's, it's a, again, an ecosystem. So it spreads outward on both sides. And that's why we see when there's congestion in a place like Chicago, it impacts New York, New Jersey. It impacts LA Long Beach. It impacts every seaport in the country. Um, and we need to start having these discussions at a national level. Uh, and and no differently than what, you know, California right now is taking a pretty, uh, a, a, a pretty demonstrative approach to local housing. You know, we need more affordable housing. They're taking away some of the local control. Well, we need to start looking at freight in the same way. And I don't want to say take away global control, but create guidelines and framework. So local municipalities need to operate within the framework of really enhancing our ability to deliver on the American economy. Because what we do for, an, for, for a living, what all of our colleagues do, no matter if they're in the shipping industry, in the terminal industry, rail, trucking, et cetera, we're helping every other business exist succeed, thrive, and we're helping create the quality of life that every American has become accustomed to for the last several decades. And when we start to take away things like, I don't want that warehouse in my neighborhood, I don't want that truck in my neighborhood, the only real way to stop that is stop buying things. And then stop that's buying. the economy. Yeah. You know, and and you're you're spot on. You are you are absolutely spot on. And the investment that we need and and this isn't to say that it's 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 right or wrong but you know we spent several years you know developing a national maritime you know transportation system strategy but it stopped at the water's edge mm -hmm. and the the maritime transportation system goes all the way to the warehouse so we need a strategy a freight strategy that is coupled with the national maritime, you know, strategy that that moves the rest of the supply chain, and this isn't just about containers. This is the same conversation that we could have about autos and bulk and brake bulk products, uh, petroleum, you know, to a lesser extent. But but there's any number of uh, natural disasters that have uh, stopped the movement of petroleum. It's not that we don't have the petroleum; it's that we couldn't get it where it needs to be. So, and they have pipelines, right? They actually have the most efficient way of conveying their products throughout the entire nation because they've built pipelines. And right. there are disruptions. We, we see, unfortunately, see them in the news far too often, but they have the pipelines. Then they also have rail and truck and other methods of delivering, which creates resiliency. And listen, we're not going to today create a conveyor belt system that moves containers off port. But investing in and, and encouraging our partners like rail to invest in more rail infrastructure, encouraging local cities to allow more warehousing, especially closer to seaports and closer to consumption hubs to get them away from it so you can get things moving. Having rail served warehouses and then, uh, you know, doing like what we like to do, which is localize the trucking. Uh, there's no reason in today's age to not uh, take the majority of the truck moves and have them operate locally right? Where you're able to every single day have those trucks operate in the same area, as opposed to send them 3000 miles away and then send another, you know, group of trucks the next day. All that means is 
we have a, a we have an exponential higher need for the amount of trucks. So, looking at this in a work smarter, not harder fashion is 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 an approach we need to take from the top down. But we need industry people involved. We need people like yourself. We need folks that actually get this. Um, this cannot be a congressional thing uh, unless we start electing a bunch of truckers and and steamship line captains and other people to Congress. Like these need to be. Uh, we need to get our charge and our framework from the federal government. This is what we want from a policy. You, National Freight Advisory Council, or whatever we want to call it, you go out and you tell us how it's going to work. And that's that's how we're going to create a framework for businesses to be successful, but in such a way where everybody wins from the supply chain working, not the supply chain being congested. I completely agree. And you know, when we started the Council at Port Performance, it it is a resiliency initiative. It is how does the Port of New York and New Jersey withstand a disruption? It could be a labor issue. It could be a trucking issue. It could be a hurricane. It could be a pandemic, right? It's about creating resiliency within the ecosystem that that we control, but we don't control it all. So you're absolutely right, Weston. We have got to, we have got to get the national freight players and everybody in the movement of goods because this is what our economy depends upon. Um, and yes, we're a much larger importing country than we are, you know, as an exporting country. But even when we reshore, um, look, and everything is working well, and we reshore, when we reshore and we supply, you know, our own people, we're still going to want to produce for others. So maybe there's a change in which we are more of an exporting nation, but you still have to have a free transportation system that works efficiently. And, and we're not quite there yet. Yeah, we need our own version of the Paris Climate Accord, right? Where we all we all voluntarily agree to certain things. I know we're almost out of time, and I have one more thing. And you can we weave this right in, but uh, you know, 2023 maybe is is the most uh, hazy crystal ball that everybody has in this industry. I, I you know, in every couple of weeks, even some of the best experts change their perception as to what's going to happen. Um, so you know, from your perspective. Uh, what are what do you think? Well, if we sat here a year from now, what are our takeaways from 2023 going to be? And I'm not going to hold you to them because they could change in a couple of weeks. But sitting here today, uh, March March 21st uh, of 2023, what does the rest of this year look like? Yeah, well, I, I think if we're having this conversation a year from now, and that we uh, on the individual port level and as a nation, haven't used this time, this breathing room, as I'll call it, to identify and fix the the problems you know uh, that we experienced in the in the pandemic. We've got to leverage the lessons learned from the from the pandemic. I think prioritize those and begin to start ticking those those off um, uh, because we're wasting time. You know, if we don't, you know, if if you normalize uh, where we were in 2019 to where we are right now in 2023, um, it's not a sky's falling. You know, it's the normal, you know, organic two and a half, three percent growth. We had an anomaly for three years. So, you know, we're on track still to do what it is that we forecasted to do when we created our port master plan in 2029. And that's doubling or tripling our cargo volume. That's doubling or tripling our cargo volume in the same footprint. So the footprint of the port is going to become more efficient, but it will only be as good as our ability to influence the rest of the supply chain and the rest of the ecosystem. So we've got to take the lessons learned from the pandemic. Um, don't let you know the grass you know start growing under our shoes, and you know really begin to work through the problems you know, of transformation. In my mind, you know, containerization started, you know, 1956, just outside my window, you know, right here in the port of New York and New Jersey. That was a transformational time in our nation's history. This is another transformational opportunity in our nation's history, and we've got to take advantage of it. Uh, I couldn't have said that better. Now, now is the time to execute what we've all learned on before the next thing happens, right? Exactly. 
Beth Ann Rooney, Port Director for the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. Thank you so much for joining us, Beth. Anytime you want to come on, we'd love to have you. And thank you for participating in our uh, homage to the great women in our industry for Women's History Month. Awesome. Thank you again, Weston, for the opportunity to be here and and for your leadership, you know, in the industry, uh, focusing on on uh, the women in transportation and, and the great work that you've been doing. You know, you're you're a newbie relatively in the industry, but you've done great things. And and I know there's a lot more in, in your future as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been another episode of People on the Move, a Cargomatic podcast. I'm Weston Labar. See you next time.